Alright, we pretty much stopped with some epilogue comment on Constantine VII. Right here, he dies in 959. And basically what happens is his wife has two kids. They're very young. And in order to protect herself and them, uh, she quickly finds some capable generals that she marries or beds or does something with in order to protect herself and her kids. And that doesn't end up working out. But the empires, in as far as being protected from the invaders that were going on, and you had basically three types: you had the Arabs, you had this, you know, sort of off again, on again, from the north of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, sometimes Hungarians, sometimes Bulgars, sometimes Russians, but generally not because they pretty much had made under Constantine the Seventh. They pretty much made peace. But you still have problems with the Arabs, but you also have problems with a new group of folks who were invading all over Europe and had just come into Italy, the Normans. And that kind of provoked a sort of desire for unity between the Holy Roman Empire and Byzantium, as I had mentioned earlier with Basil. So, you know, it's kind of like he leave, his wife ends up with her two kids and she gets some generals so that she can protect the empire and they do a really good job of protecting the empire from invaders not so good a job when it comes to um, you know what do you want to call it proper domestic policy you know it was sort of uneven there wait a minute it was sort of uneven there but basically it's kind of like the same old same old one guy's got a brother who's in, and he puts him in a position of power and the brother gets fancy ideas or he's got kids and they get fancy ideas and yada 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 all this musical chairs at the top and that basically goes on until here the last of the guys and the, at this point there's nobody really related anymore okay the last of the guys dies in 1041 AD and so it's kind of interesting th that this language would be used know that the door the summer is near yeah summer is a time for war okay and what they'd been going through was m mostly um, you know the kind of garbage that people go through up at the top of power they all I don't know it's like they all get drunk and they hyperventilate and hy hallucinate that power actually means something frankly you know I, if you just look at history the last thing on earth you'd ever want to do is rule a country or be at the top of the heap in anything You'd want to still like do a good job and you'd want to achieve something, but you wouldn't want to be famous. You wouldn't want to be known. You just want to do a good job. Yeah, you might want to make some money. So you can be comfortable, but as far as gaining anything, you know, and fancying yourself making a big change in history, guess what? Whatever you've done has already been done before and somebody tried to beat whoever did it. I, I don't see anybody being happy who's at the top. So, know that war is near. Know that summer is near. This is the word for summer. Teros. Okay? So, yeah. Summer's very near for the guy who died. I forget his name. He, he, our, he gave himself some fancy name. Okay? He dies. At this point, the empire begins to dishevel. Okay? It had been held together because it had good generals, it had good troops, it had good practices, and enough things. But by this point, those good things aren't holding up anymore despite the top being so screwed up. So between the screw up of the top, staying screwed up, and the dishevelment at the bottom, the empire starts to crack big time. So that's when we're going to have to come into here. 
It says the ones, you know, even you, the ones who, who see all this come to pass, know that, and this is the word for door, know that the door is near. In other words, here we're talking about the door of destruction. And at this point, it's 1071, and that is exactly what happened in 1071. Between 1041 and 1071, the empire went into a, a lot of disarray. And in 1071, what happened was, I forget the guy's name, he was one of your interesting Arab rulers. Um, I, think, I can't remember his name. But he actually beat the Byzantine army in the field. He captured the Byzantine emperor, and the question he asked him was, well, what should I do? Should I kill you or send you back? The idea being, hi, if I send you back, it's kind of understood that you're not going to go attack my stuff. And the Byzantine Emperor said, you know, I, I don't know. Do, do what you want with me, or it'd probably be better that you killed me. You know, or I'm not sure what, what his reply was, but the Arab who beat him, the Caliph who beat him, said, okay, I'm sending you back. So he sent him back to Byzantium in 1071, and they killed him. The town, I mean, you know, the city of Byzantium, they killed him. They were so mad at him for losing. This is the kind of the generation that occurred from the time we go back up here. And it wasn't too good then, okay, in 959 with Constantine the Seventh, And then there was a denouement of the empire itself, not just the people fighting at the top. The empire itself st started to erode. And 40 years later, or 30 years later, it was so bad that they got beaten in the field finally and um, by the Arabs, who they had been beating the Arabs. Remember when we were looking at verse 26? They were the ones who had been beating the Arabs. Or was it verse 21? Yeah, verse 21. Okay. Or verse 20. Verse 20. Uh, I always get confused. Yeah. Verse 20. I've added a lot of text now, so you have to get into here. Starting with Leo the Third, They were winning wars. Okay. And then here you had Constantine winning wars. And then here, at verse 23, you have Theophilus winning wars in a sort of miraculous manner. But that ain't happening anymore. Oops. That ain't happening anymore by the time you get here. Byzantium was really at, at one of its weakest points. And to add insult to injury, they're going to have four years after the 1050. They're going to have the great, uh, well, no, 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 that's 1071. The great schism occurred nine years after, no, uh, 1054, this is 1041, so it's 13 years after. So, basically, Omina. So the great schism is, schism mean the word to become. The opposite of becoming is to get, is to schism. And that's the great schism right there. It's kind of funny, you know, that you know, the one who sees all this stuff coming to pass, when, when you see, really, hotan means when, see, in the same manner, even you, when you see all this coming to pass, and here the coming is this great schism between Latin and Greek church that they're just... We're just, we hate each other so much, we just excommunicate each other. Okay, when you see all that coming to pass, that's 1057 there, so minus 3 is 1054, yeah. When you see all this coming to pass, know that the door, the door to the ellipsis, the door to the rapture, the door to destruction, the door to bad times is right next, is next. It's got a lot of, it, 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 First of all, is a, this whole text is first of all what are the signs of the coming of the tribulation, okay? 
and it's not a timed thing. That's what he's trying to explain to them. He's using the language of the tribulation to show that it's not the tribulation, but it's like dress rehearsal, constant dress rehearsal, because Satan doesn't know what's going to happen either. So he keeps trying to jockey history so that it'll be ready for when it happens. Okay? So know that, you know, the, the trib or the bad times are next. And at the door is what this is. And the other time at the door was used is in Matthew. And unfortunately, it's our t What the hell? What the... Try again. Is in Matthew. I've spiffed up the Matthew thing. You'll be able to download this once I post this video. Down here... Um... This is our time, and I've, I've really remapped it. Let's see, where are we, where are we, where are we, where are we, here we are, here we are. Okay, um, he closes the door, right here. That was 1998, our 1998. Now, it's the parable of the wedding supper, but it's got still the similar connotation. Door opens, door closes. It opens onto something bad or something good. It closes here on something good. And this is a really bad period of history that we're coming into. Which is why I'm doing so many of these videos now. Because I didn't know anything about this until February. Anony Nominom found it. And he kept bugging me to look at it. And I was stubborn and wouldn't look at it. Well, now I'm not stubborn. I'm trying to make up for lost time. There's, there's something really, truly bad. Just so happens it's going to be under Trump now. We know that much about it. There's something truly bad that's going to start happening in 2023. And it could be due to Trump. It could be due to things other. But this is bad, bad period of history coming up. When Christ says to the pro-lifers, I don't know you, if he's got to predict it, that that's what he's doing, and he did, using the keywords we need to know to know who it was and what it's about in advance, because that's what prophecy is for, then it's going to be bad. And I, we're still trying to figure out how bad and what it is and all that stuff, because you're supposed to know what time it is. Okay, the rapture is the rapture is the rapture. It can hit any time. But meanwhile, if you're still on this earth, you're supposed to know what time it is, and he's mapped it out. So do you know? Did you bother to learn? Did you study scripture? If not, guess what? When the disaster hits, you're going to get swept away. That has always been the message of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It's not any different now. It just so happens that, well, Trump is the guy that's being used. There's also some kind of big Bible manuscript find going on right now. Because these are our years. This is 2015, 2016. This is 2017 to 2018. And that's all I can tell you. You know, and you'll know if it's right. If, uh, you know, tomorrow you wake up in the news and somebody else is some great big find in some monastery somewhere. Meanwhile, we go back to ancient history. In ancient history, the turning point for the Byzantine Empire pretty much had started back here with Constantine the Seventh. All right, and his start is documented and kept here. This is when his son uh, Romanus the Second is born, and that's what undoes Romanus the First, because his kids get all jealous and worried that Constantine the Seventh's kid, who's named after the dad, and the dad's starting to say, "Oh, I shouldn't have been so mean to Constantine the Seventh because he's doting on his grandkid, or he just is waking up." Um, this one hell starts to break loose. And their sister is married to Constantine the Seventh, and so there's civil war in the family, and Daddy ends up, you know, getting tonsured and becomes a monk, and you know, just drops out. All right, and then Constantine himself lives that long, and then his wife with her kids. I want to say that they they last until this long, and then after that, it's like one long series of baloney stuff going on until here and then here even the baloney stuff isn't working anymore and the Byzant Byzantine Empire is starting to lose 
in its endeavors so much so that they get beaten by the Arabs here which had not happened before I mean seriously beaten okay so then we have to pick up at sort of like the prequel to this the prequel to the you know to losing in Byzantium at 1071 you can go look it up in, in Google um, because this is a need that they verse and the question is does it fit somehow with 26 is it part of some kind of loop or part of some kind of nest or some kind of center, but I have to also explain to you what center means. Center means a bunch of turning points in history that are all foretold. And they were, but I haven't covered them to you yet. They're all in here. So what does this mean relative to that? Well, what was that? So i got to explain all that to you in the next increment. So just for now, we stopped at 1041 A.D. with Byzantium starting to fall apart at this point and where we're going is Byzantium losing against the Arabs big time such that the Emperor when he returns to Byzantium having been defeated is killed by his own people in Byzantium so from there on it's not going to be good now the only last comment I want to quickly make is what bothered me and still does but uh, it's some kind of style Mark is sevening these parts. This is like, you know, there's going to be signs and wonders by the fake Christs. Why would you seven that? Okay? He sevened, he's, he sevened it here just before the verse that says, If the Lord didn't cut those days short, nobody would survive. Why did he seven that? Alright? And then this one is standing by itself. Okay? Just see to it, I told you in advance, and he seven sat. I don't understand. But it's like back to back. Alright? And then he does it again. And I, I tried revising this. I looked at variants. I tried doing everything I could to change these numbers. Alright? And, and I even tried taking this out. This is a crassus. And here's, here's, what, here's how you'd say it. Chi. Chi. See, this is chi by itself. It's chi dunamis. Chi dunamis. Chi en tois uranois. Remember when I talked about that? Salute sontai. Okay? So you don't say chi, chi, that makes you sound drunk. It's inelegant Greek in those days. Today's Greek, forget it. Chi. It's like K-H-A-I in its sound with a lot of breath. Chi. Chi dunamis. Dunamis. Okay? All right, what this says is, and the powers in the heavens are shaking like an earthquake. I've covered that before. It has to be that, because this is 15 to go with that at 15. They're, they're deliberately paired clauses. All right. Why is this seventh? And then next? Kai tot opsonte. I'm not sure if this is tot or tote. But I think if they're being dramatic, they're not. They're not gonna elide it. Kai kai tote opsonte ton huion tu antropu er homenon en nefeles felis. Okay, that's the twenty-one. That's nine ten. I mean, I can see kind of like why. The sarcasm reason for this is, is pretty bald. Okay? Because everybody who looked on, see, upsonte means to look upon. And the whole verse that Christ actually said is they will mourn when they look upon him. Mark is leaving out the word mourn. When people looked on Constantine the Seventh, who's alive here and under the regency of Romanus the First, they didn't like him. He was ugly. He was sort of like 
taciturn, which means he didn't say much. You know how annoying that is when you talk to somebody, you try to have a conversation, they go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And finally you give up trying to have a conversation. He was like that. It wasn't that he was a bad person, or I don't even know, maybe he was, but it just wasn't sociable. And you can argue all day about, well, you know, if you were raised like he did, he had a pretty bad childhood, then you'd be that way too. But the point is, is that he wasn't, so they mourned to look at him. And he's the son. See, he's the son, the ruler. And remember, in their own terms, the emperor and the church are indissoluble. This is what's so wrong with the Byzantine mindset and the Byzantine Empire and the Byzantine religion. The empire and the emperor and the church are one. So Christ is like not important. So you see the satire by using sun here. Oh, you're going to treat the the, em the emperor and, and me and I go good relegated to the background even though I'm the guy who paid for your sins. Okay, well then you can look on him and you can call him the son of man. Good luck with that. Coming in the clouds. Yeah, witnesses and clouds of hoofs of horses later on. Which is what happened because by 940 AD, our boy Constantine VII had a kid. And when he had a kid, Romulus I, his regent, starts to have second thoughts about being regent. And then his own kids say, oh, no, Daddy, if you do that, then now that, now that there's a real heir that's from a real sitting, sitting guy, you, and, and, and then we get cut out. So then they take Daddy down. And their sister stays with her husband, who's Constantine VII, and her son, see, because she's now got a son, born just about at the end here. The scholars are not sure. It's either 938, 939, 940. All right. Well, that upsets the plans of you know Romanus is first the kids who all wanted to take over after Daddy died and depose Constantine VII. So all that kind of wordplay is very satirical and makes sense. What doesn't make sense to me is why is it seventy? I don't know, but I can't come up with a I can't come up with any way to change the number. The closest thing I might be able to do is call this Crassus, or not Crassus, but Elysian, so it would sound like Kai Totopsonte. But this is such a dramatic phrase, and it's a quote from the Bible. Actually, it's from, from the Old Testament. It's like Kai Tote. Opsonte ton huion tu antropu. Er comenon e nefralais. Nefelais, nefelais. You see, so I don't think, I think there's a pause here. I don't think they're going to run it together. Alright, so then it gets weirder because then it's like, well, what about here? Why is this 70? And I can't change the numbers here. I, the reason why you have to include the autos is because it's it's shown for equality and drama. Yes, the angels are, are just as important to God as you are. Because, you know, we'd look at them and think, Oh, you're so beautiful, I shouldn't even count. Why do I count? It can't be true. So I had to actually do the Tote elision here in order to get the euphony that clearly Paul um, Mark's intending. Okay, look. Look how it sounds. Kai tota posteli tu sangelu sautu. Okay, that's a, that's the first line up here. Second line. Kai epis kai tu ekleg tu sautu. See, it's meant to have the same flow and sound at the end to show equality. Kai epis tu ekleg tu sautu. See. It's meant to be 12 each. Alright, I mean, you could take the out out of both of them, but not just out of one of them. 
and too many manuscripts include at least one of them. So I'm I'm saying the one, that, so, you know, every manuscript has at least one of these two, and some have only this one, and some have only this one, and some have both of them. Well, both of them. Okay. So that that has to be right. Okay. So then, why is it seven? Who is he get? This is saying, you know, and and the thing is, is that this clause belongs to the prior clause. So why doesn't it seven? It's because this is saying, and then everyone will see him coming in the clouds. This says with great power. This is the word for great police also sort of stands for people and glory okay so the great with this is like an adjectival clause or adverbial clause for how he comes so it belongs to this verb well I mean yeah. it does it belongs to it okay so why is it beginning a new for you know a new seventy. Now you could, but it's just it's just not normal here. With the, with great power and glory, and that breaks the that breaks the cadence. With great power and glory, and then he sends his angels, and then they collect all the elect, his elect. And they, from the four corners of the world, from one end of heaven to the other. But this doesn't seven? It sevens here? How come? I don't have an answer for that. I mean, the, there are, the numbers belong to specific dates of what was happening in the Byzantine Empire. And the text belongs to those events in a very biting fashion. I just don't choose to cover them now because I've already made so many videos. You can check it yourself now that you know how it works. The dates fit. The years fit. The texts fit. The history. But does it have to seven? What does it mean if it's seven? And the answer is I don't know. Okay? Maybe you'll find out and you'll tell me. I'd really appreciate it if you do because it's driving me nuts. Okay, so again, after our boy Constantine the Seven dies, it's sort of a musical chairs thing. His wife and her two kids survive and they each get a chance to rule and she's married two other guys in the meantime and they've had a chance to rule and by the time we get down here all those chances are up. And the Byzantine Empire starts to crumble, literally starts to crumble. But the territories start to break away. People don't disrespect, don't respect the rule anymore. There's too much infighting at the top. All the signs of a disintegrating empire are here, starting here. When the last smart guy dies. Okay, so we're now in descent. And then this is where Byz Byzantium is taken over by the Arabs. Well, not taken over, but beaten, and he didn't even bother to take it over. So, it's dark. So, at the door, yeah, right at the door of Byzantium were the Arabs, and the guy didn't even want to take it. He just sent the emperor back. And right at the door, as soon as he gets in the door of the fortified city, when he gets back, they kill him. So, you see, it's still biting for the history. It's amazing how biting this is and how accurate it is. Okay, so what do we say about Idete? The prequel to this is where we'll come back. And wh what, what am I supposed to say about Amen Lego Humin Hoti? And why is it Amen Da? Preview of coming attractions. Because Paul, I mean, Mark uses it in 14.9. So he's making a bookend with 14.9 when he does this. Peace out for now.